How's everybody doing today? Yeah, I come from the frozen chosen. No, I'm just, we had eight inches of snow the other day, but uh, that evening the sidewalks were basically dry. We, we have more sunlight days where I live than Orlando, Florida. So we just learned if we get out early enough and shovel the snow, the, the sun will be out to dry the drive, driveways and the sidewalks off. So it's just kind of something that we do. We Sometimes we'll just go out with a sweatshirt and it'll be 25 degrees, but we our humidity like here is so low, it doesn't bother us. So, but anyway, it's good to appreciate Dr. Sharon for this opportunity and appreciate seeing everybody, some new faces and some old faces, amen. When I say old, I mean in time, amen. Not dragging so, but praise the Lord. I didn't look at you. Dr. John, I just wanted you to know. No, I, but I did notice the picture that they had of you up there looked like your younger brother. No, I'm just, I'm just giving him a hard time. Amen. But praise the Lord. Um, I apologize. I came in a little bit late for Sunday school. If you got a chance, you ought to come for Sunday school. It is so good. Um, I'm a note guy, and I left my post-its. I always carry post-its. So I had to get my smiley face post-it. I always carry a smiley face post-it. Look, I just marked it all up, amen? Got some good stuff, amen. So it, I, I like to say it this way. If you think it, ink it. You know, a lot of people just look at their phone. They look at, you know, but I like pen and paper. I like, if you think it, ink it, amen? Uh, if you got your Bibles this morning, our, our main text is going to be in Hebrews, but we're going to start out in James chapter 5. But Hebrews 6 is going to be our main text. Um uh, you know, in the last four or five years, I've went back, redid a bunch of things, uh, preached a lot of messages from the heart. You know, how the how you know the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues or the wellsprings of life. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the bunch of heart, the mouth speaks. Life, you know, so you can always go back everything to the root of the situation. I'm one of these guys that doesn't want to do something like 10 times the wrong way I'd rather just sit down, get find out the solution. Because I don't want to talk about the problem. Because, I mean, the problem is going to be there. But identify the problem, then find the solution. It takes care of the problem. Amen? So I was just thinking about some things here uh, not uh, uh, long ago. And I sat down and uh, I was eating lunch with a, a minister. And he challenged me. He said, go back and, and either rewrite your sermons, start over, do something new, and, and I've done that in the past because I know the recipe for bread might be hundreds of years old, but the key is to make it fresh. Amen? So I, I, I said, Lord, I want to be like a sons of Issachar. And sometimes when I ask the Lord that, I don't know what they did to become a sons of Issachar, but they knew how to cooperate in the time that they were living. And they knew the seasons. And the Lord ministered something. I actually had to look it up for me being from where I grew up. It was a big word. It was conscientious awareness. Now, you and I know where we're at right now. We're conscious of that. You know that you're listening to me. You know the city you're living in. You know the crossroads over here. You're conscious of that. But conscientious awareness is actually stopping and perceiving the situation you're in and seeing. It's almost like a instead of having a perception, you have a perspective. Or you see what I'm saying here? So when I'm in a situation, I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, great, I'm on another airplane. I say, okay, God, what opportunities are available and what are you trying to speak to me right now? All I need to do is have the power on the radio and the, the signals will always come. But if I have it turned off, the waves are still coming, but there's nothing to perceive what God's trying to say. Amen? So... Jesus, with that being said, Jesus rebuked the uh, Pharisees over and over. You know that. But you know he only rebuked the crowd one time? One time. You know what it was for? He says, you don't even know the season that you're living in. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Scriptures, I realize a lot of things point to the time that we're living in. We are the generation. People say, I don't know why I was born. I don't know. This is such hard. I've had such a hard life. But God knew that you were supposed to be born in this generation, at this time, in this place. So He's given you a grace and ability to where your sufficiency is going to be a good enough. See, your sufficiency is insufficient. Your ability, in other words. But you were saved by God's grace or sufficiency or ability. 
Because Paul said it the best. His grace or sufficiency is good, is, is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. So you've got what it takes to get where you are going from where you're at with what you have. Amen? You know, when I travel a lot, one thing I learned is this. I, I, I think I took 81 flights last year. And people say, well, how do you do it? I say, it's a mindset. See, always remember this. A mindset goes into an attitude. And an attitude goes into a lifestyle. So when I get a mindset then it, it becomes like this. It's one thing when, you, when you're consecrating on faith and patience and different things like this, all of a sudden it gets into the attitude. I've been here before. I can tough this out. I'm going to make it because I've made it before. My God's faithful. All of a sudden when you repeat that, it becomes a lifestyle. Instead of learning to witness, you become a witness. People, instead of you coming to tell people who you are, what you got, where to go to church, they come to you and tell you who you are, what you got. And they follow you to church. Why? Because now you're lifting him up. And he said, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men into myself. Amen. Now, let me hurry up. I, I kind of preach fast, so you'll have to listen fast. But I want to talk to this morning about something I felt I really should uh, um, preach on. It's called the power of patience. I went back through, redid a bunch of stuff. Added, you know, just it, It's almost like having company over. You didn't have no groceries but you put something together. You don't throw it together, but you realize, man, this is a great meal. I think I'm going to fix this every week. But when I started going through and trying to cooperate in the time that we're living in and realizing that the Lord told me not too long ago, He said, I don't want you to just keep talking about what is happening. I want you to start saying what you want to see happen. So I, I started decreeing and proclaiming every night, even though I was so tired last night. I went I, Right before I went to bed, I got my, my things out and began to pray pray over them and decree and speak things and pray over my family and do this. Why? Because I want to be one of those that are living in the time and understand the season that I'm living in. So I want to talk about the power of patience. And the subtitle is, it's the stabilizer to our faith. Now, and again, I, I preach fast, so it's only 25 after 11. I think in Hawaii it's 25 after 8. So we got plenty of time this morning. No, that doesn't work. Never does. James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 says, So be patient, brethren. Now, how many of you this morning are Christians? Let me just see your hands. We'll just do a quick thing. Let me see your hands. Everybody in here? Okay, we got, uh, I believe, 100%. You, you, okay, he's, all right. <coughs> I believe we got 100%, so we just say five minutes in the altar call. The reason I bring that out, it says, so, then, so be patient, brethren. When I looked at that second word, I found it also in Romans 12. But then also I found it in another scriptures where it says, be not drunk with wine where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I found that word be also means be steadfast, unmovable, always bound to the work of the Lord. Found that says be holy. It talks about be sober, be vigilant, be not afraid, be willing, obedient. Preach the word, be in season and out of season. Let not your heart be troubled. So I looked the word up be because I know some people like the Greek and some people, you know, all this. But it, it actually means being, B-E-I-N-G. But when I got into it more, it says when you're being something, that means you're authentic. You're not acting. You're not acting. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you're being something, you're authentic. You're not acting. They say when you're acting, that means you're putting on a performance. You're going through the motions. You're, you're given the appearance of something. That's like if, let's say this room was, let's say in the summer this room was 110 degrees and Dr. Sharon found something that you could simply plug into this three-way plug over here. And it had four blowers in each room. And they guaranteed in 10 minutes it would bring the whole room down if all the windows and doors were shut to 75 degrees. Guaranteed. Walked over, plugged it in, nothing happened. Thought, well, it must be defective. But what happens if she only plugged it in halfway? That's the reason why. See, a lot of people are only plugged halfway into the socket. Therefore, they have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power thereof. God's saying, if you're going to be there, be all there. If you're going to be what you're supposed to be, then be it. Amen? I thought about Shakespeare. It just came to me. To be or not to be? That's the question. Amen? So be patient, brethren. 
as you wait, as you wait unto the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest of the land. See how he keeps up, he keeps up his patient vigil over it until he has received the early and the latter rain. Until. So you also must be patient, establish your hearts, strengthen and confirm them in the final certainty, for the coming of the Lord is very near. Luke 21, 19 says, In your patience possess ye your soul. Amen. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let, uh, let us not get tired of doing what is right, for at the right time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. But here's one of my new favorite scriptures. 1 Peter 1, 9 in the King James says, Receiving the end, or one translation says, the outcome or the result of your faith. How many knows if you're in faith, you're going to have an end to your faith or an outcome or a result to your faith? That's why he said in Hebrews 10, 35 through 39, that he, said, he says, after you've done the will of God, you shall receive the promise. Jesus is the author and the finisher of whose faith? Our faith. Amen. So with that being said, go, let's go to our main text in Hebrews chapter 6. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this, But beloved, now he's talking to the Christians here. Everybody raise their hand to my knowledge. But beloved, we are persuaded of better things for you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous, now watch this, unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Now, I want to take a pause here since Dr. Sharon talked about Ministry of Health. Uh, I go teach at a, at a Bible school, and I, they ask me to teach the itinerants. And sometimes they say, well, how did you get where you're at? I said, well, I could, I, 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 I could tell you what I did before I came to Ramah, but when I was at Ramah, I did children's church for 18 months. I ran cameras uh, for 13 months, and I did a prayer group for seven months. They said, no, really, what did you do? I said, okay, I did children's church for 18 months. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I did whatever I could. I didn't know what God had really specifically called me to, but I knew I could be faithful with what people say. Yeah, but you don't understand, I work a lot. So I went back and figured up my hours. I worked 58.8 hours as a manager. The first couple of years, I, may, I, I did right close to 45 to 49 hours, and I was taking three classes a day, five days a week, not counting the homework and the other, you know, other things. Now, I'm not bragging on me. I'm, all of this. The reason I say that all this is this. I came across verse 10 one day because I thought, well, does anybody even know what I'm doing here? Because we would go in on four and five hours on Sunday morning because the church was so big, we have 50 to 86-year-olds. It's like herding cats. You're sitting there doing the same lesson for an hour because we had so many groups in that first grade. We would rotate every 10 to 12 minutes and I would start over with the thing. And I would teach and all of a sudden a hand go up and said, Mr. Todd. And I thought, man, I've connected today. I said, yes, Tommy. He says, you have bad breath. <laughs> so when they asked me, how did you get started? I said... Look, if you want to be a leader, learn to serve. If you want authority, look for responsibility. I said, listen, all, all, when, when you get to the place where you teach in front of adults, all you're going to see is kids in big bodies. So when I came across verse 10, listen to this. I realized God gave me a personal week when I read this to say thank you for what you've done. Listen, I'm going to read it again. For God has done unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards His name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. People ask me one of the biggest things, how do you get full-time ministry? Volunteer full-time, part-time, do something. Bloom where you're planted, amen? That was just a little side trip. I reclaim my time now. No, I'm just... Verse 11, and we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Now verse 12 is the key here. Are you all ready? It said that you might not be slothful, but followers of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now I looked up one translation. It means this. 
in order that you may not grow disinterested and become spiritual sluggers, but imitators, behaving as they do through faith and by, watch this now, and by practice, by practice. Now, I found this out a long time ago, and I'm so glad I learned it when I was younger. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Just because you do something wrong 20 times doesn't mean you're getting better. <laughs> Keep showing up. Come on. I, when, I, when, the, when I did children's church at Rhema, uh, that big Bible, uh, uh, that big church, I said, I'm not sure what to do. They said, that's fine. We'll, get, we'll train you. They said, but we just need you to keep showing up. And I kept showing up. Guess what? I become one of the teachers. Not the lead teacher, but I become one of the teachers. Amen? Now watch this. And by practice of patience, endurance, and waiting, are now inheriting the promises of God. Now I don't know about you, but there's a word in verse 12 that's very important. How many knows that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith? But faith will only take you so far when you're believing God to get to an end result. Did you know that? So when you come up against a wall, you say, well, I don't know if I have faith, enough faith. Well, faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. doesn't come by reading unless you read it out loud. doesn't come through meditating unless you speak it out loud. It comes by hearing. The Word of God is voice activated. But that faith will take you and you say, well, I don't have enough faith. I must have weak faith. Well, it doesn't matter if you have weak faith or strong faith as long as you have faith as the size of a mustard seed that you might say. But I found out between the amen and there it is, there's something that you can do that God will do produce in your life. It's already available. You're not trying to get it. I like to say it this way. Stop trying to get what you've already got and quit trying to become somebody you already are. In, in the hardest times of your life, you might be sitting there going, God, I don't know what else to do. Well, I'm going to show you in just a moment what God tells us to do in this situation. Now, I want to say this real quick. This is very important. When you read in Hebrews 6.12, it says through faith. And what's the word between faith and the other one, patience? It's the word and. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I was born in 1961. You can figure it up. But I grew up in the 60s and 70s with cartoons on Saturday. We didn't have the cartoon networks. We didn't have all these different things. Monday through Friday, it was almost like my parents would threaten me. You're going to miss your ride. Because my dad, was a, had a, he was a contractor. Sometimes his secretary, which actually was almost related to us, she said, I'll just come pick the kids up you know, before I go to work. Or sometimes you had to catch the butt, whatever. But that Monday through Friday, you what are you're not even dressed yet? You haven't even eaten. You're going to be late. Well, I've learned some different things after listening this morning to uh, 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 Sunday school. Amen. Different phrases. But what I'm trying to tell you is this: on Saturday morning, before almost anybody got up, without alarm clock, without even person, all of a sudden I was up turning on the TV watching H.R. Puff and stuff, Scooby-Doo, come on now, Adam, Ant, Bullwinkle, and Rocky, the monkeys, don't sing the thing for me, please, the monkeys, but there was one, and I'm going to separate the generations right now. The other half is going to Google it, and the other one's going to finish it. You remember a show, and it's still on YouTube, and you can listen to the theme song. It's called Conjunction Junction. Conjunction. They had a caboose, they had an engine, they had one card, that had the word what? And. I thought, man, cartoons were educational. Because I'm using it today in my sermon. I found out that you can have a lot of faith, but it doesn't mean you have any patience. Now you have what you need inside of you, but it's like a muscle that you don't exercise. Now watch this. Let's say I have three jars of peanut butter and two loaves of bread. How many knows I could make a really big peanut butter sandwich, but it would never be a peanut butter and why? Because I have no jelly. So I'm going to, I, she's fine. It's, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me a bit. Just, she, she says more things positive than most people say negative or when I preach sometimes. Now listen to this. No, seriously, listen to this. So what happens is God is wanting to add some, a jelly to your peanut butter when you're in the hardest times of your life because it's through faith and patience it's through peanut butter and jelly 
Are you all seeing this? Okay, now watch this now. When you get into the scriptures and you start realizing in verse 12 that word patient also has six other meanings I found out that were parallel to it, which I was shocked. It says you can say through faith and patience or you can say through faith and endurance, through faith and constancy, at C-O-N-S-T-A-N-C-Y, through faith and steadfastness, through faith and perseverance, through faith and forbearance. And here's the one that threw me off. Through faith and long-suffering. You can put that word in there. And I found out that long-suffering is the fourth fruit of the Spirit after love, joy, and peace. So I found out you already have what you got, but you got to connect it to what you have working. Amen? So don't complain you're not eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich if you're not going to get it out of the cupboard. The jar's there. You've got to open it to add it to what you already got. I'm going to show you this. Now, if you don't mind, could you put up one of the uh, first screenshot? I asked Dr. Sharon if I could do this, and they were gracious enough to help me. But I was sitting there one day, because I fly a lot, and I thought, I wonder what causes planes from going out to the right and to the left, stalling out, going down. Now, watch this. You see, you see, now watch this. What, what's it say right there? The cockpit. Okay, watch this now. Now, how many knows that your God is not your co-pilot? That's why you get screwed up. He's not your co-pilot. Stay out of it. Fly first class. Now, here's what I want to show you. God, it, the, 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 the airplane, now notice the fuselage. That's the body. That's your faith. Inside of that, we usually call them the passenger or the cargo. Let's say it's the, it's the promises of God. How many knows that faith can take the promises of God from one place to the other? Amen? But notice the next one. I kind of got educated on this. And I'm not trying to make it work to fit my sermon, but I'm going to show you. Can you do the next one, please? Now watch this. What, what's that say right up there? That's the rudder. But what's next to the rudder? The vertical stabilizer. Now, I think this is really interesting because the verticals... Now, I know there's different models of planes, but we're just basically using the typical passenger plane. So we know the body is faith, and it's carrying the promises of God. But how many knows between the amen and there it is, you're going to find some turbulence or just some disruptions, rerouting, recalculating. But you know what most people do? Well, maybe I'm not supposed to be. I see it always happens. What if I, I called Dr. John, I come into town, or Dr. Sharon and said, hey, uh, let's just take a drive around Las Vegas. Oh, where do you want to go? Oh, nowhere in particular. I just want to drive around and look for potholes. How, ma how many knows you don't have to, quote, drive around in Las Vegas to find potholes? They find you. But when you hit a pothole, you don't turn around and go home. Or if you see one coming up, you don't sit there and beep your horn at it. You don't sit there and complain and talk about it. You either go around it, through it, or over it, but you go to your expected end. Well, the devil's like a pothole. Quit looking for him. When he shows up, deal with him, but stay on the road, which is the will of God for your life. Now watch this. The vertical stabilizer. I'm going to read this. The vertical stabilizer next to the road, rudder keeps the plane, or you and I, from rolling out to the right or rolling out to the left. Is that amazing? Let's call them attractions or distractions. But what's the rudder? Well, if you look down here in James 3, 4, it says, Likewise, look at the ships. Though they are so great, driven by rough winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, or tongue, one translation says, wherever the impulse of the helmsman, this is translated governor or pilot, listens or determines. Who has control of that stabilizer? The person in the cockpit. God says, listen, I need your voice. When you're in the hardest times of life, I need you to praise and not complain. Come on. If you praise, you'll be raised. If you complain, you will remain. I don't deny the situation I'm in. I don't deny the circumstances, but I deny the right to stay there because even Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before Him. The cross was something He was going through. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thy will be done. He endured hardness in Hebrews 12. He went forth. He pressed towards the mark. He put His hands on the plow and pressed. In other words, He set His face as flint. He didn't allow His 
tongue to gear him out to the right or left or start talking about the problem. Why did Peter sink? He began to look off away from the expected end, who is Jesus. Now look at the next one. What's that called? Horizontal stabilizer. But what's next to the elevator? Uh, uh, there, elevators. I just gave you the answer. Is the, is the answer true or false? True. No. Now, the horizontal stabilizer keeps you or I, the plane, from flipping upwards and stalling out or causing the plane to stall or prevents a nosedive. I looked up the word and I thought, Lord, I don't want to stretch this to make it fit my sermon. But elevators are almost like I said earlier, it's a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a lifestyle. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Set your affection or your elevators on things above where your life is hid with Christ. Mark 4, 24 and 25 says, Take heed to what you hear, for who has will be given, and who has not will be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. So when you hear something, watch what you guard. Put bouncers like at a bar on your thing. Hey, if this doesn't have chapter and verse, if this is not God, I'm not going to allow it. Because see, one thing it is, is this. Let me see if I can do this. When you hear something, whether it's the Word of God or not, it's information. It's logos, basically. The Word is logos. Through the information, it goes into the, I call it the imagination. I call it the warehouse of images. We call it your imagination. Well, I'll give you an example. I could say a cactus, or I could say Garfield the cat, or a big black Labrador retriever with a red ball around his neck with his tongue sticking out with his tail wagging running straight towards you. Every word added a new dimension to that image in your head now. So, so through information, imagination, or images, through meditation, causes an impartation, causes a, a saturation, germination, which produces a proclamation, which causes demonstrations and manifestation. I think I, Brother Hagin said, get your thinking... Believing and speaking synchronized He's, or in harmony or unison. He said, you'll experience the promises of God. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So what gives access into the heart? Thoughts. What, how, how do you know you really believe something strong enough? 1 Corinthians, I think, 4.13 says, I believe, therefore I speak. So when you... This is your rudders. How many, how many wants to become instrument, I call it instrument rated in the Word of God where you walk by faith and not by sight? Where you call those things which be not as if they were. When you feel like all oh, hell's coming against you, to go, nope, for me and my house, we're going to choose to serve the Lord. Amen? So that's when you go through the hard times of life. Now, now stick with me here real quick. One of the best examples I've, I've saw of anybody having patience and all the things they went through was the Apostle uh, Paul. Look, look at Acts chapter 20. I think I gave it to him. I'm not for sure, but if they didn't, I got it still. Acts chapter 20, verse 19 through 24 says this. Are y'all getting anything out of this today? All right, we're, we're, we're going to hit some, we're going to get to where we add the uh, peanut, uh, jelly to your peanut butter here in a minute. <laughs> okay, look at this. Acts 20, verse 19 through 24. Are you ready? He said, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me in lying way to the Jews. Watch this now. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you, but I have shown you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But verse 22 is one of my other favorite scriptures. What do he say? But none of these things move me. Neither I count my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy. And the ministry I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was under the New Covenant, New Testament. He had the revelations. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Who we are in Christ. But did you know under the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was in Paul, but the Holy Spirit was upon David in the Old Covenant. Infilling upon. 
What did he pray when he was in the tough times? Psalm 51. Lord created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. A steadfast, persevering, patient, enduring spirit. Cast me not from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why did he pray that? Because he knew in his presence was what? Fullness of joy. Then he went on, he said, but restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I'm not talking about happiness. You buy somebody a new car and they're happy for about six months, they'll complain about it. Because if they're a complainer, complainers complain. I don't care if it's new or old or paid for. But if you got joy, you're happy with the unicycle because you got air to tire. Amen. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to show you how to add some jelly to your peanut butter here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I need to take you everywhere I go and just make everybody happy. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 5. Okay, let's see here. I know it's in my Bible. Here we go. Now look at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now watch this. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. That must be a misprint. But we glory in tribulation. Now we're look, not looking for the pothole. But when you hit the pothole, I wish you all was here at, at Sunday school. And I, I, I wish I didn't miss. I was running late because I, I put my vitamin thing in there and I shook it up real good. I had to, we, uh, Brother Lou and I went out to eat and I didn't want to get anything on my tie, my dress shirt. So I didn't want to, you know, come to church with a spot. So I, I went right over and did it. When I did, I popped my that little water bottle. Well, I have the screw-ons at home. When I popped it, it went, boom! And I went, praise the Lord. <laughs> kind of looked in the mirror. I had to check everything. I was like, thank the Lord. But this morning, we was talking about the good things that we can say, the goodness of God. How many knows there's a lot of things you can say positive in a neg negative situation without compounding the negative. All right, let's go on here. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation is what? Work of patience. You know, I looked this up in another translation. It says, Moreover, let us be full of joy now. Let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that pressure, affliction, and hardship produces jelly. I mean, patience. Watch this. Did you see that? It says this. Knowing that they produce patience and unswavering endurance. Now verse 4 says what? And patience, experience, and experience, hope. Verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost who was given to us. Let's read verse 3 again. It, this is so important. Moreover, let us be full of joy now. Let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the pressure, affliction, and hardship produce patience and unswavering endurance. Now, I'm going to give you another one. It's going to be really interesting here. Turn, turn to James chapter 1. Look at verse 1 through 4. Now watch this. Every time I turn to James, sometimes it seems, well, not every time, but it's like, you know you're going to deal with the mouth. Verse 1, James, a servant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. I think it's interesting that he wanted to acknowledge all twelve tribes that were together probably at one time but through persecution, hardship, and affliction, they scattered. But he says, I don't care what has happened, what you did, or where you're at. Greetings to all of you. He might as well just be saying that to every one of us here with all of our backgrounds, cultures. If they, you know, our, every, I mean, we're all so different. Amen? Now watch this, verse 2. My brethren, he's talking to everybody that raised their hand earlier, count it all joy... When the Raiders win a game. No, it doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> Count it all joy when you, not when your brother, but when you fall into different or diver temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of whose faith? 
your faith worketh patience, but let patience... People are like, oh, I don't want to hear this anymore. Let, well, be patient. Amen? <laughs> but let patience have her perfect word, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting what? Nothing. How many knows the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want? What does it say in the same passage? He said, though I walk, you're not going to be a... Lord, I, I want... Please, please, Lord, I don't want to do this. Please, I don't know why. Well, I found out a lot of times your lack of knowledge, your disobedience, your tongue got you in a lot of these situations. And a lot of times God will take what was meant for evil, even if it was self-inflicted, and, and, and use it for your good. So I'm going to say this twice. When you're in a hardship, now if you're in a hardship to where it's life or death or it's an abusive situation, or you, you know just the things that could be life, you know, then this is not applying to that. Because, you I mean, if you're drowning, I mean, you don't sit there and go, well, I'll just wait it out. No, or I'm in abusive, or I'm, I'm in a situation where I need some immediate help. I'm not talking about that. But when you get in a situation, now I forgot what I was going to say here real quick. Uh, if you're in a difference, oh, come on, Lord, bring it back. It was a great point. All right, it'll go on. It'll, it'll come back. I promise you it'll come back. Okay, well, watch this. So when you read this in a different translation, it says this. It says, it says, um, consider it wholly joyful. This is verse 2. Or maxim, that word W-H-O-L-L-Y actually means maximum. When you're, listen, consider it maximum joy, my brethren, whenever you're enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith brings out the endurance, the steadfastness, and patience. But let endurance, steadfastness, and patience have a full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects lacking in nothing. How many knows God's coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish? I'm going to just sum this up. I know what I was going to say earlier. When you're in the hardest situations of your life, whether they're self-inflicted or the devil brought it on you, I'm going to say it twice. Stop asking God to get you out of the things He's using to produce what you need. Stop asking God to get you out of that situation because He's using it to produce what you need. If it's life or death, that's different. But when you're going through a thing, it's like this morning, we learn. They're just, you're just going to have to learn yourself. Sometimes you're going to have to let your children fall and spill something. Sometimes you're going to get your tongue into something and you say, you know what, I'm going to own up to it and I'm going to deal with the consequences. But when you go through that, God will use what was meant for evil to produce what you need to take you where you need to go. Amen. Come on, I'm going to get to the good part here in a second. Now, I looked up the word patience and I think I have uh, started 20 after, so... What I got? Ten more minutes? Fifteen? I don't know. See, you all have Siri. I have Doctor Sharon. So if you if you bear with me, I tried to condense this study down, but I think this is very vital. And then we'll get to our last few points, and we'll close. James one four it says, "Let patience have her perfect work, being entire, wanting nothing." I found out that this word patience in James 1.4 is actually the same word referred to Christ when he was going through his situations. Listen to this. Give me about one minute. That should be all it takes. If you're timing me, then spot me 15 seconds extra. So James was writing to believers who were undergoing hardship here. Are you ready? The word patience in verse 4, you could say that this word means to remain in one spot, to keep a position, watch this, resolve to maintain some territory that had been gained. It is the state of mind that says, quote, this is my spot and I'm not moving. When I was studying this, I wrote this off to the side. Hold your position until it changes your condition. Hold your position until it changes your condition. The determinant inheritance of this word patience in verse 4 is clearly seen when used in a military sense. To picture soldiers who were ordered to maintain their position, even in the face of fierce combat, their order was to stand their ground and, quote, defend what had been gained. To keep the ground, they had to be courageous and do whatever was required. No matter how hard or difficult the assignment, their goal was to see that they survived every attack, held their position until they had outlived and outlasted the resistance. These soldiers had to indefinitely and definitely stick it out until the enemy 
realized, how many knows the enemy does not have patience, has no fruits of the Spirit, realized they could not be beaten and decide to retreat and go elsewhere. Thus, this word in verse 4 of James, patience, conveys the ideal of being steadfast, consistent, unwavering, unflinching. It's the attitude that declares, quote, I don't care how heavy the load gets or how much pressure I'm under. I'm not budging one inch. This is my spot. And I'm telling you right now that, these, that there is not enough pressure in the whole world to make me move and give it up. Although the King James, this is, is the best part. Although the King James translation of this word patience in verse 4, a more accurate rendering for once is endurance. One scholar calls it the staying power, wherein another contemporary translator called it the hang in there power. But these translations adequately express the right idea that this is the attitude that never gives up, it holds out, holds on, and outlasts and perseveres. But listen to how it refers to Christ. James 1 4, the word patience. In Revelations 1 9, this word is referred to also as the patience of Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 3 5, this word is also in the phrase, the patient waiting for Christ, which could be translated the patience of Jesus Christ. The attitude that hangs in there never gives up, refusing to surrender to obstacles, turning down every opportunity to quit. This word also illustrates the patience endurance that Jesus demonstrated during his trial, scourging, and crucifixion, even though the assignment was the most difficult task given to anyone, Jesus stayed with it all the way to the end. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Whew. I don't know about you, but this is what we got. This is the jelly that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this fake on sale, Jerry. I'm talking about the, the stuff you get straight from the vineyard. Amen. It's better than Welch's. Now let me let me show you some things here that you and I need to do, and we're going to finish this up. There's some things that will enable you and I to remain, have this patience, this jelly to be added to our faith. It will enable it to remain to stabilize our faith. Hebrews 12, 1, I just said it. Where so seeing we are so proud, also compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, you and I, lay aside every weight, and number two, the sin which so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and set it at the right hand of the throne of God. The second one is this. It says, endure hardness and don't become distracted. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 through 5 and verse 10. Listen to this. Take with me. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Are you all ready? He said, take with me your share of the hardships and sufferings which you were called to endure as a good first class soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier when he's in service gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who has enlisted him. Now watch this. And if anyone enters competitive grain, grains, games, he is not crowned unless he competes lawfully, fairly, according to the rules laid down. Verse 10, Therefore I am ready to persevere and stand my ground with patience and endure everything for the sake of the elect, God's chosen, so that they too may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, the reward of eternal life. See, one phrase that the Lord has told me, now I can't tell you, but told me, to basically get out of my life. He can't, he can't quit saying it is what it is. He showed me. I mean, I'm not saying I had a vision or anything. He just showed me. He, he said, Genesis 1, he said, I didn't stand out and look at the vast darkness and said, well, it is what it is. We've gotten a habit. Years ago, society got in a habit of saying, instead of uh, uh, being eloquent and art uh, articulate with your words and carry out a formal conversation, to explain, we just say yada yada. We've got, I, I'm just saying this. I almost got in the habit of saying everything. Well, it is, it, is. it is what it 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 is. I was trying to avoid any type of conflict. And every time I come against the wall, I had a lot of peanut butter, but I had no jelly. Because I said, it is what it is. He said, call those things which be not as if they are. Now, I'm going to show you this, and, and I'm going to wrap this thing up. How many knows in Galatians 3, 
29, it says, Now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are His heirs, and God's promises to Abraham belongs to you. Now, if you got a moment, turn back to Hebrews 6.12, and I'm going to try to finish it up with this. But I'm going to show you how I believe that God wants us to add the peanut butter. Now, this is my own, uh, just through the Scriptures. We are heirs according to the promise. We're joint heirs with Jesus, heirs of God. We have the right to proclaim and do. People say, well, I don't feel worthy. You weren't worthy before you got saved. The only thing that made you worthy was the blood and the shed blood of Jesus upon the cross. And you're obeying it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now watch this. When you're in the hardest times of your life, don't sit there and talk about the pothole or the mountain. He said, speak to it. If it's poverty, if it's lack, if it's a relationship, whatever it might be, you proclaim the Word of God. You speak it out. I watched a video just recently of a guy named John Bevere for two minutes. It says, when you have four contacts in the Word of God per week, they said nothing happens after three. The fourth time you're in the Word of God, or you hear the pastor say, open your Bibles to so-so. Four times a week out of seven days, four. They said, pornography, stagnation in a relationship, your relationship with God, all these things between 30 and 70% drop immediately. Just drop. They said, but your confidence in the Word of God and sharing the Word of God goes up to 200 to 220%. With four contacts in the Word every week. So when you proclaim the Word, you're hearing it, and you most likely will believe nobody more than what you hear out of your own mouth. Because you've said it enough to where you believe it, therefore you're reintegrating what your belief system is by speaking it and hearing it and saying it. Think, believe, speak. When you do that constantly, you'll go from a mindset to an attitude to a lifestyle. When you come up against something, you don't say no way, you say Yahweh. You speak to the mountain and you sit there and you say, Father, I thank you right now. I don't deny the situation I've gotten in. If I've done it with my tongue, a lack of knowledge or disobedience, I'm asking you right now to forgive me. I'm not denying that this situation exists. But I'm not going to ask you just to get me out of it and all this. I'm going to ask you to produce something I need. Watch this now. Watch this. Don't walk around with open wounds in your life. The only thing I know that Jesus kept in His resurrected body was scars. Keep scars. Because that shows you're a sign of an overcomer. You went through it. Just because you've been in the military for 25 years and you got a certain rank, that doesn't mean you have war experience. You might know about war. You might do this. But when you go to war, you don't really need to read the book so much because you've experienced it firsthand. Come on. You go to God with your situation. Don't go to the phone first. Go to the throne. Don't, don't go to the aspirin bottle. Go to the anointing bottle. Get, get it to where you worship and say, Father, I thank you. You said your faithfulness is unto a thousand generations. I thank you that your love surrounds me. I thank you, Father, right now that you will never leave me or forsake me. Father, I thank you. And you just start worshiping God and thanking God for all the things He said and done in your life. And all of a sudden, I don't know how this happens. It's like a black cow eating green grass and giving white milk. I don't know how it happens. But it sure does they good with Oreo cookies. Amen? Now watch this. You're going in a hard situation and your faith only took you so far. You have the peanut butter and it's taking you so far. And you're like in a pit. But you know what the Lord said? I almost forgot to read this. It says, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, but they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. It says that when you're in that hard time, it says, watch this, a clay lamp is one, that word lamp also, or candle means lamp. A clay lamp that fits in the palm of one's hand was made of inexpensive material. What made it valuable was the oil that was poured in them. The lamp itself could not produce any light at all. Its ability was totally dependent upon the oil. It says you and I carry the precious oil of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and describes us as earthen vessels. Now watch this. These, it says these lamps in Jesus' day that gave out light, once were immersed in oil and lit, that lamp would burn continually as long as there was a supply of oil. How, what, what causes the oil? This is when you're filled and you begin to praise and worship God. See, don't let singing replace worship. 
Now watch this. This tells us if we stay filled with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 5.18, we will never lose our fire or allow our light to go dim with God. It says, keep letting your light shine before men to influence them and to glorify them. In other words, it says this, you have a power of influence. Don't let the devil or anyone put a bushel over your lamp. I looked up that word lamp when I was studying all this, and that word bushel, it says it means don't let anyone put a bushel over your talents, your ability, or your personal influences and gifts. So it says if you put a lamp in the corner, it will only illuminate those that are in the corner. And I put this in my personal life. Don't put your lamp just on the table. It will only illuminate the ones closest to you. But they says when you're in a hard time, get your lampstand and put it on a lampstand. I looked up the word uh, candlestick or lampstand. It refers to an elevated stand on which an oil lamp is placed. So instead of putting it in the corner on the table, he said, get a lampstand or, or, and, and get it or a candlestick and hoist it as high as you can. Listen to this. It would provide the maximum amount of life to all those that are in the room or your life at that moment going through your hardship. It says the amount of light it provided would de 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 determine by its position. The higher the light, the brighter the light. So when you're going through a hard time in your life, in your situations, and there's people you will never know until you get to heaven. You'll never probably meet them. And they're going through a hard time and all this. They were shipwrecked in their faith. They got bitter instead of better. And they got up and they, all these things began to happen. And all of a sudden they seen a flicker of light. You're walking past them in your quote spiritual life. And all of a sudden you begin to sit there instead of learning the witness, you become a witness. You, let, you hoist it up and you say, Father, I thank you and I praise you and I glorify you. I'm not, I know this too shall pass. I know these situations in my life, whatever it is, I repent of. But if the devil meant for evil, you're going to turn it for good. All of a sudden, I'll go back to it, like a black cow eating green grass and giving white milk, God takes our praise and enthrones himself upon it. He inhabits the praises of his people because we're standing there with the peanut butter, but somehow he produces what we need called jelly, adds it to our faith right where we're at and takes us where we need to go. And when we come out, I guarantee you, there's a lot of people that you may work with but never know their last name. People you go to church with, people you live in the same neighborhood. They will watch your life and they will come out and say, I don't know what they did, but they went through the same thing I do every week. But they somehow have a smile at the end of the week on their face. That's, lady, that's, that's learning to witness instead of becoming a witness. Go, Hebrews 6, and we'll close. Look at verse 12. We'll go back to our main text. Now, how many knows we're seeds of Abraham? Verse 12, that you might not be slothful, but follows in them through faith and patience, inherit the promises. For when God, watch this, for when God made promise to Abraham. We just read this in Galatians 3.29. Because he could swear by no greater but by swear by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. One translation said it this way, and I'll close with this one. And so it was with Abraham, having waited long and endured patiently, realized and obtained what, what was pledged to come, what God had promised him. Folks, I'm telling you, we're living in a great time. Stop talking about what's happening. I know when COVID hit, I traveled a lot. I didn't travel as much. I took about two and a half months off. My son was doing homeschooling on virtual online, so I stayed and actually worked on a manuscript. I mean, a paper but I did like 33 churches or trips I forget which one it was and I had people coming up to me and saying well wait a minute now listen I'm not against it if you wear if I was told to wear a mask today or where I do it I do whatever I can to get from A to B but I felt like the Lord says I want you to be conscious of where I want you to acknowledge what's going on I don't want you to have foolishness or presumption but people was asking me certain things as I traveled. Are you traveling? I would never respond to them. But one thing I want to tell you is this. We're in the world, but we're not of it. The reason I'm bringing this up is this. You can't watch the news to get informed. You're going to get programmed. I'm going to tell you right now. 
I was traveling all over. And one person said, well, I don't understand it while you're traveling. I said, well, why is the airline still selling me tickets? And the hotel still rent me rooms. And the cars still rent me cars. And the restaurants are still feeding me. And they said, well, I never thought of that. The reason I bring that out is this, with a parallel example. Stop and ask God. I'm born in this generation for a purpose, for a reason. I can't go by popular opinion or what the world is saying. I'm asking you to tell me what I need to do while I'm here in this world so I can let my light shine and do your purpose. So when I come up to the, against the hard times, I know that you're always going to produce something I need to add it to what I got and take me where I need to go. So who am I supposed to reach at this time? And I'm going to challenge every one of you. And I went just almost 55 minutes. I want you to ask God. Now watch this. God, I don't want churchianity anymore. I want Christianity. God's not in steeples. He's in people. God, what would you have me to do? And one thing I had to do was break my routines. I had a lot of routines. I, I, I did the routine so good, I didn't even think about it in my life. I go home on a Monday, do this, do this. Tuesday night was this. I knew this and all this. Get ready. On this, okay, get ready Friday night. Fly Saturday. Do this and this. I stopped and said, God, I want to cooperate in the time that I'm living in. So when I come up against the hard times, I know how to get through them. But I'm asking you to give me the conscientious awareness to realize why I was born in this time. And when I, then I realized this. I was asking God to do something in my life, but I was going to have to do something different. So if you want something you never had before, then you may need to do something you've never done before. Cameras is a good place. I'm not, I'm not promoting, quote, the ministry. I'm just saying, think outside the box. I didn't know how to run cameras. I didn't know how to do a children's church. Come on. I, even if it's volunteering, get involved in the Word because when you stand before God, he says, listen, I'm not really concerned about all the things that you did. I wanted to know what you did for me. Amen? Did you get into hard times of life and always ask me to bail you out? Or did you go through it and learn from the situation and get the scars and now you can look back and help somebody else go through it and say, listen, I didn't read this out of a book except this one. But I've been there. I've done that. And all I can say is this in closing is this. Through faith and patience, we shall receive the promises. But the biggest thing is this. No matter how desperate it gets, always remember this phrase. God is faithful. Amen.